Hello and welcome back. I'm delighted to have the panel with us live um, for the final piece of today's uh, event. And we've got a lot of questions coming through. We're going to try and work through as many as we can. I will leave some. Also, Henning Gloystein will be asking some of the others to the group. Um, we've had a question in Japanese as well, which is brilliant, and we'll look to come to that at the end. Um, so to kick us off, um, I guess to the group, um, what are the participants' views on the marginal cost rule on utilities and a follow-up, should it be removed? Who would like to go first? I've either got all of you on mute or none of you sure. Who, who feels brave and wants to tackle that one first? I'm going to take that question. Go so on, yeah. that, 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 that question, um, that, that, that discussion just started last week, actually, if my understanding is correct. So that's two, or uh, it's, it, it's mixed. So, but as Takaisa mentioned um, in the early of the, of the session, so uh, it's, yeah, uh, for, for generators, it, it's kind of uh, challenging for them to uh, ensure the profit. So um, it's, it's not, um, fair probably um, for generators, but um, in the very beginning of the deregulation, I think it, it was unnecessary probably, but um, maybe decided to like a start discussion last week. So um, in the future, uh, probably that rule is going to be updated. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to say like the determination or something, but, but I think in the future, it, it's going to be more fair. That's my opinion. Thank you, Rio. Um... Always start with the hardest questions while we talk. Yeah. Um, and another one um, to the group again is around culture and how much how much do cultural differences play a role in market development? Um, and you know, do EEX and then the participants, so the panel here, include cultural awareness as part of their business practices? Would anyone like to take that question? I, Tom, would, love, I would love to take that question. Um, so for, for, for Arico, our, 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 our premise is, is, is all to do with dealing with um, clients in their native language and trying to understand their culture. And we become the conduit to the central part of the market. And, and I think, um, and, and Rio will also be a testament to this, I think that culture plays a huge element in the communication of this, of this growing global market. And... Um, and, and, and kind of and maintaining that and understanding that and developing that is, is a really interesting thing. I think that a lot of this stuff is, a lot of business is conducted in English, um, certainly even with the Japanese clients that we're dealing with, but we're now starting to see a shift to where um, Japanese uh, entities want to have legal documents in Japanese rather than in English and so on and so on and so on. So I think that we've had this kind of growth period from our, um, our, our European English speaking friends. And I think now the Japanese entities are starting to think, okay, this is time for me to get involved and time to find time to move, for me to get involved and stuff. So I think there is definitely, there's definitely a shift and it's interesting managing the two. I think, uh, I think it's going to present some challenges, but I think that everyone's, you know, welcome to those challenges and willing to kind of accept them. You could also look at it from the trading perspective and from a, coming from a different angle. I think from a, the trading side, you would always want to look at the fundamental analysis of the market and study where you think prices are going to move, but cultural behaviour can also impact um, the development of prices. So I actually think it is good to, to understand the cultural behaviour of participants in the market. And that might not necessarily just mean the Japanese, but obviously in Japan, the Japanese company's behavior in that market is important. I, I think it is really important. Yeah, it's actually a good point. Fantastic. What we find is that we find across different, we find across different countries, uh, we find across different countries or um, different cultures that you will kind of tend to tend to be either the price maker or the price taker when it comes to certain trades. And that level of aggression can be, can be down to culturally how people operate as well. That can also be quite an interesting thing for the way that, for the way that we interact with different clients. Fantastic. Thank you, Tom. Henning, I, I can see there's lots of questions coming through and I'm conscious we pick ones um, when I want you to take on these. Any particulars you'd like to put to the group? Yeah, um, thanks, Luke. Uh, so 
we know that in, in all commodity markets, uh, especially electricity, because it's such a fast moving market, data transparency is important. So I want to ask uh, two people uh, on this panel a quick question on that. Um, Julie is a trader at heart and Tobias is a banker. Uh, how, how, just how important is the transparency side in power markets? How good or bad is Japan's power market transparency? And lastly, do you reckon METI will do anything soon uh, in the likes of what the European Union has done in the past? Maybe Julie first as a lady. Yeah, I think I did cover quite a lot of this in the initial discussion, at the early part of our discussion, but I would say it's absolutely vital. Um, it's not just nice to have, it's a must have. And we, we wouldn't expect the data to be immediately available at the start of a new market happening. A lot of people I've spoken to about potentially entering the market say to me, well, we're not going to enter the market until all the data is there and we've got all of these things lined up in place and it's a perfectly functioning market. And I always say back, well, when we started in Europe trading, we didn't have all those things. It was a natural development as the market development that all these additional things fit into place. I think Japan still needs to be allowed to have a natural development like that, albeit it should probably be a bit quicker because they can copy what happened in other markets and get advice from people from other markets. I can, to, be, to be honest, I can just mirror what um, Julie Wood was just saying in terms of um, that tr obviously the transparency on data is vital for the growing market, but I think we're just at the beginning that it all starts to become much more transparent. A big role plays uh, EEX, a big role play uh, the, the price reporting agencies and uh, everybody who's looking at the market analyzing consultancies um, and also brokers. Yeah, they bring a lot of transparency uh, for their constituency. And I think they are you know, so far doing actually a, a great job in increasing the transparency. Thank you. Um, one thing I know we've touched on it in the previous discussion a little bit, but I know it's on everyone's heart. I mean, we saw sky high prices recently, but in a lot of market, markets, especially where uh, renewables coming in, negative prices are a possibility. As I know, as far as I understand, they're not really a reality in Japan yet, but um, how important or how, how are they on what are the risks? I mean, is this, is this a reality to be introduced by EEX? Um, maybe one for Bob. Um, that's a very hard question to answer because negative pricing uh, is not only, you know, happening in the futures exchange, but also should happen in the physical market as well. And when in the, you know, discussion uh, session, the point that the Julie mentioned was, I guess she was mentioning about the physical market, which is JEPX, yeah. which doesn't allow the negative pricing at the moment. Like I said in the discussion, uh, at this moment in Japan, we are not discussing negative pricing. Rather, we are discussing floor pricing, how to raise the marginal cost, uh, you know, rule in the JPX. So, you know, I really want to have your view, especially from Judy, about the negative pricing. Yeah, I was wondering about the negative pricing because I'm a strong believer that the JPX would benefit from negative pricing. And I was wondering if maybe some um, large generators or utilities listening might think, or that may be horrified at the prospect of, of negative pricing, but um, you, how it would work is it sends a signal when there is an oversupply, and it would often just be an individual half an hour when there is maybe too much wind or too much sun with not enough demand from end users. It, it allows for the people to get paid to, um, consume more power or it allows for people to get paid to switch off planned generation. So it could mean that if you've got a power station and you're planning to run base load all day, when there's too much um, renewable energy for certain half hours within the day or potentially, often it happens at weekends in Europe, that you could actually receive more income to switch off your plant and not run than to receive a low price or a zero price to continue running. So 
it can actually still be more profitable for power producers to have that ability to have negative pricing. So I thought hopefully that will clarify things for people. Uh, Julie, one thing that I would like to ask from a Japanese viewpoint, how was the European power generators reaction when the first negative pricing was introduced in Europe? Were they horrified or did they get used to that? Or what, how was the situation? I don't remember specific reactions, but I would expect that on the initial um, suggestion that prices could be negative, your initial thought is, well, that means that, what does that mean for me? Does that mean I'm going to earn less income if I've got an asset? I think it takes a little bit of analysis and studying to understand properly how that does impact different people in the market, different players in the market. Um, but once you understand that concept, and it is a really strange concept, um, it becomes it becomes natural and it works very well in Australia as well. They have negative prices a lot of the time, but only again in individual tiny periods, it can sometimes go negative and then the next half hour, it can be highly positive. Thanks, Julie. Um, there's two interesting questions here from participants that I'd like to read out. I'll start with the first one, which is, uh, I don't know, maybe one for Tobias. Uh, for the marginal price rule for generation, can that include any hedges, derivatives, the generator bought, or is it only a physical cost? Okay, if, if Tobias or Tom, you're on mute at the moment, there was some echo, so let me unmute you now if you're trying to respond. I'm not sure I understood that question, actually. I want, would you be able to repeat it again? I don't know that you guys did. Could you say sure, it again? I'll just read it up. For the marginal price rule for generation, can that include any hedges, derivatives the generator bought? Or are you basically talking only about physical costs? To be covered? I believe it's, it's only for the, the, the um, actual physical costs, yeah. excluding hedge and other derivatives. Okay. The marginal thanks. cost of, the, of running the actual yeah. asset. Yeah. Yes. Okay, thanks. And then there's here from uh, Lars Weber from Valhall uh, GK. Did any PPS already start to use EEX directly to hedge their portfolio, or are the current traders predominantly used by trades predominantly used by international players? I guess that's one for the brokers to say who are the players. Uh, my understanding is the number of like, like uh, uh, Japanese retailers or uh, traders is still uh, limited, but increasing. That's my understanding. And I do see a, a, their, their um, demand from retailer side because they have uh, like uh, EX has um, weekly products and huge liquidity and currently as, as they said uh, in their area of the session. So uh, we do see uh, the huge demand. So the, the number of their uh, Japanese retailers is going to increase and increase more. That's my opinion. Are you noticing, Rio, a trend for inquiries from Japanese companies asking your company about the market? Have you seen that the of those guys increase? Yeah. So not yeah, necessarily people already trading, but asking questions and you know asking about the market. Yeah, yeah, I, I do have a bunch of questions from um, both uh, traders who already trade at EX and, 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 and the traders who don't use EX. So yeah, I, I do see the demand, yeah. yeah. Can I make a comment from mm -hmm. a EX point of view? As far as uh, PPS companies participation goes, I think what's happening at the moment is instead of directly opening the account and joining the EX market, I think there is a lot of indirect participation on the part of the PPS companies by uh, big players. You know, like Stefan Ridiga said in the discussion session, there is a multi-layer system in the commodity markets. So if one cannot trade directly the EX, he or she can trade with the big boys and the big boys trade with the EEX. So I think, you know, this kind of evolution of the market is not very special to the power market. I have seen that in the metals market, in the petroleum market, in every market. So I think this sort of a multi-layer system is going to develop in the Japanese power market going forward. Yeah, yeah that's a good point, Bob, because I remember seeing that a lot in the coal market, in the coal derivatives market the utilities mm. would trade via a third party to, to access those derivatives. Yeah, you're right. 
or a bank and, then, yeah. and then and then the bank could offer the execution but it's it's kind of it, it's it's always interesting and you guys are, you're, you're absolutely right what, what we've seen with 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 the a more exotic EEX products that we've listed in, in uh, the Balkans, for example, in Europe, is that people will use people will use a conduit to get to the market, and they kind of I think they they have to prove that as a use case to their management, and then they say to their management, "Look, we need to get access directly ourselves because that will enable us to deal directly with the brokers, get better pricing, uh, get better market access." So it's kind of like an evolutionary thing. It's sort of a stage two kind of development. Um, certainly, we're seeing we're seeing what we're trying to do at the moment is aid a lot of Japanese firms with trying to understand how clearing works and how to onboard clearing, introducing them to clearing banks and, and those sorts of things. The advantage to us, of course, is that if people are trading via EEX, it makes our lives much easier to to broker those trades. So, um, yeah. And I just want to one more uh, reason why I, I see the demand recently um, after after the spike. Um, in January, we do see a, a, the issue about the credit. So uh, the retailers who are short, like uh, struggle or to pay the cash, right? So I, I, I do think that in the future in, in Japan, uh, I think credit is going to be a, going to be a uh, issue. So um, that's, that's one of the most important reasons why I do see the demand for EX. Um, can I ask uh, Tobias a quick question? I saw him on the side here. So, what is for the bank the main? I mean, you're a French bank. You sit in Singapore. What? Why is Japan exciting for you? Is it for your clients, uh, as you've said, you do these hedging services, or is it, you know, derivatives itself, clearing member, uh, market maker? What, what What are you looking for in Japan's power market? Uh, you're on mute. Yeah, no. So yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for the question. So for uh, for us, um, you know, we are we are obviously a French bank, but we have a strong footprint in Japan. Uh, so we have uh, you know a full bank uh, over there with local staff, uh, you know, who are also helping uh, obviously us uh, together with the clients. But the key driver really behind. Uh, um, you know, our uh, drive is um, that uh, BNP has taken uh, a strong view on sustainability um, and to uh, support clients on their investments into, um, uh, into sustainability. We want to be uh, with our clients or for our clients uh, present in those um, markets where um, basically our clients are investing in uh, renewable assets in, in have a or fulfill their sustainability uh, strategy. So that is the key uh, driver for us um, to at, in the beginning to look at the um, um, uh, at the Japan power market, and obviously we, we look beyond that, uh, you know, um, across um, APAC. But uh, that is one of the key drivers for us. Yes, um, and maybe one more for Bob. Um, there's a question, sort of, what the future products are that EEX is eyeing to launch to to make the market more attractive. You know, there's different market models, continuous markets like in Europe, um, auctions, and um, you know, what can we expect? Yeah, well, you know, uh, I really cannot uh, represent the uh, uh, product uh, development uh, colleagues uh, over EX in the headquarter, but I guess, you know, LNG, which has been the focus of the discussion over the past uh, few months in, in Japan, which actually caused the skyrocketing price in the power price, so probably more liquid LNG uh, spot market uh, somehow linked to the indexation of the LNG, you know, maybe JKM or whatever, or maybe Japan LNG, you know, uh, customs clearing price or something like that is one of the possibilities. And also going forward, like uh, we discussed here, um, the, the green uh, electrification uh, is, is a trend in this country towards uh, 2050. Uh, just like you know other countries as well, so probably environmental product uh, such as uh, emissions trading or things like that is going to be a very interesting product to go with the power market and the LNG market. And you mentioned a few uh, buzzwords there, I think, with LNG and green. Um, I know. So one thing that pops pops up a little bit, and we mentioned it in, a, in the initial debate, but how you know with renewables coming up in, in power markets we've got negative pricing but 
another option is that other markets have seen is, is um, uh, uh, capacity auctions. Uh, how, how do you uh, regulate a market or make it attractive for the power industry to, um, to prepare for more renewables and how can that be priced? That's a very general question, I know, but anyone who feels like he wants to answer that, please, or she. Negative prices? <laughs> I can't think of anything else. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to, Back to negative prices, fair enough. <laughs> Anyway, I'm going to jump in at this point because we've had a, a question that, that came through on, on the, um, the virtual app in Japanese. Um, and I'm, I'm going to invite um, Tony Crane, who's one of the advisors to EEX, just to um, translate this in Japanese to the Japanese um, members of the panel, and then we'll put it to the English speaking thereafter. So, so Tony, welcome. If you could actually put the question out, that'd be fantastic. Thank you, Luke. Uh, the question in Japanese is,海外の方々でデニオコ会社のJEPXでの自主的取り組みに基づく限界費用での玉出しを知ってる方々はどのぐらいがいますでしょうかってでえっとset simply in in Japanese the question is how many overseas players know about marginal cost rules on the JEPX? Thank you, Tony. And um, Bob, do you, want, do you want to go first in Japanese? Uh, 今の質問, oh, so uh, Luke, you want me to uh, speak in Japanese first or you want me to speak in English? Yes, please, Bob. If you could speak in Japanese first and then come into English, we'll bring everyone back, back into the conversation. Is that okay? Oh, okay. okay. あ、まずあの、日本語で言いますけども、限界コストでJPXに余剰電力を提供しなければいけないルールを外国の方々はどれだけ知ってるかという質問なんですけども、あの、おそらく電力市場に詳しい方はよくご存知だと思いますが、一
there is a ongoing discussion on the part of the METI uh, to review this rule to, um, uh, to, be, to be more adaptive to the current market situation. If there is any change in the rule going forward or coming very soon, I think that kind of fact is going to be known to the rest of the market. Mm -hmm. I think this is a very important issue to address the transparency of the Japanese market for the non-Japanese non players who are actually providing the liquidity from overseas at the moment. I think the other point is, um, really, we would, we would want rules to be as stable as possible. So it can be quite dangerous in markets where outside influences such as governments or regulatory bodies change the rules um, and that brings nervousness into the market when when companies want to trade it because if you're changing the rules you're moving the goalposts so there needs to be some sort of um, methodology for discussing the rules with all the market participants I think that that's what we would have it have in Europe with the EPEX committee where all the companies are involved in discussing potential new rules to make sure that they're understood by everybody, but also to make sure they don't cause damage to liquidity because they're changing the way the pricing structure works. Yeah, you mentioned, I mean, that's back to transparency and regulation. It's very interesting. Yeah. And I know when we were discussing prior to the event uh, that there's big interest in like some sort of a trade association of Japanese yeah. power traders to be formed to, to represent those interests. Um, I, I figure probably you all agree about that one. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Well, look, folks, um, I need to step in and actually put an end to the live session now as, we, as we're running slowly over time. But I think the comments just in the last few moments have really pushed home the, the importance of communication, how we are. We're talking about collaboration and building markets together, but we've got to be able to give and take. And I think big credit to EEX. In fact, even today, it's been an exercise in communicating to different audiences, I think, for uh, Bob to Kai, Tony as well, with NEX and Michael Wilbur Jones, a key part of what they're trying to do. So um, let's keep talking and keep moving it forward. So on that note, um, thank you to the group. Um, very, very much appreciated. Some wonderful insight. Um, and hopefully Julie will make it on our, our, our honour to learn what everyone else is thinking. That's part of this conversation, <laughs> absolutely. Um, but on that note, I'm going to hand back now to, to Stefan Riediger and then Bob to Kai, who are going to say... Um, some closing remarks and, and some next steps. So thanks to the panel and Stefan, back over to you.